Okay, so let me continue where I left off in the last lecture. So if you recall, uh, I was trying to explain to you the meaning of uh, integrating over function spaces. So I was also explaining that uh, the reason why we need to do this, uh, the reason why we have to introduce this concept of integrating over spaces of functions is because in many applications in physics, we are usually called upon to uh, integrate over all possible paths a particle can take and uh, you see the path is itself some function, it could be a function of time for example. So that uh, the position as a function of time is a path. So in uh, you could uh, be called upon to integrate over all possible paths or in StatMec it could be uh, possible configurations of uh, you know the phase space uh, of the system. So basically you are typically called upon to integrate over all possible uh, paths that a particle can take. Now so the, because the paths and so on are functions, uh, you have to know how to integrate over functions. So and not only that, uh, the uh, integral over paths are associated with some weight. So that means not all paths are equally probable. Uh, some paths uh, can be more probable or less probable and typically those uh, the probability of given path being uh, uh, taken by the particle is typically given by some kind of a probability distribution like the 6.18. So that means uh, the interpretation of the left hand side PFDF is that that is the probability that the Part, uh, particles path is between f and f plus df where f is uh, a path that it might take. So in other words, uh, different paths have different probabilities given by this. So that is typically how the problem description is uh, posed in physics. So of course I have not uh, reached, I am not motivated the, the physical aspect of this. So you might think that this, where does this all come from because I have never come, you might say, I have never come across this before because you know in classical mechanics there is no question of probability of some path. Basically path is unique, I mean it is determined by the equations of motion. So mostly I have in mind quantum mechanics where the uh, path taken by a particle is not fixed. That means that different all paths are possible with but some are more probable compared to the others. Well, I have to specifically say the, the probability amplitude associated with a given path uh, is different compared to other paths. So the question is uh, whatever it is that I should finally be able to make sense out of integrating over paths with or without some weights, typically with weights such as this the 6.18. So with that sort of an application at the back of our mind. Uh, what I succeeded in doing was I have succeeded in uh, proving to you that uh, even though the, uh, you know, so, so if, if there is some quantity depends on the path, obviously the, the, that particular quantity is not well defined because the paths can uh, change, uh, meaning that there is no fixed path, that different paths, uh, all paths are possible but some are more probable than others. So because of that a, a, a quantity that depends on the path will not have a well defined uh, value because all different paths are equally possible if not equally probable. So now the question is, uh, so even though a quantity that depends on the path itself does not have a specific value, it is perfectly legitimate to talk of the average of that quantity. So in other words, if there is a quantity that depends on a path and that path changes uh, with different different probabilities, then you can always speak of the average of that quantity as the paths change. So that sort of, so, so typically if that quantity that you are interested in is of this sort where f is your path and u is some arbitrary fixed function of x. So now uh, if you average over all possible paths where f is the path you average over all possible paths, the final answer has to be something which depends only on u and of course the inputs that are there in the probability distribution itself. So if you remember that I selected my probability distribution specifically to be the 6.18 which has the lambda and a and b and all that in it. 
So now uh, because uh, that is the choice of the probability distribution and this is the choice of the quantity whose average we want to calculate. Of course, you might be wondering why am I interested in calculating the average of this particular quantity. So I, I, I told you already I am going to refresh your memory very soon. But suppose you really wanted to calculate the average of this quantity or uh, you follow a series of steps which involves basically uh, rewriting it in terms of some shifted uh, meaning you shift uh, you shift your f to a value such that uh, the endpoints are 0 rather than some y1 and y2 and then uh, because the endpoints are now both equal uh, you uh, interpret that as a indication of periodicity so in other words you uh, realize that that means it's the f uh, that uh, shifted function is periodic and then you do a Fourier series and then having done a Fourier series now uh, the coefficients now are discrete but infinite in number but at least discrete. So you can integrate over each one of those discrete coefficients uh, in uh, one by one and when you do that you end up with this result okay. So and where uh, un is described so that u of x was some externally uh, given um, function uh, that you uh, decided to insert in that definition of the quantity whose average you are interested in. So that is that is a given but then, then small u is not uh, uh, something randomly chosen but it is basically the function which extremizes your uh, probability distribution. So in other words the, the most probable value of the path. So u of x is the most probable value of the path and this is your answer to this average that you are looking for okay. So we spent a considerable amount of effort uh, and derived this so this is a unique exact answer to that question if so long as the probability distribution is uh, nice and simple like this in other words it is a Gaussian okay. So I also told you that uh, the reason why we are interested in the average of a quantity like this is because uh, you can easily calculate uh, quantities such as average of f of x by simply differentiating with respect to u once and bringing down an f of x and then putting u equal to 0. So if you want uh, average of f of x into f of y you differentiate with respect to u of x and then you differentiate with respect to u of y that will bring so each time you differentiate you bring down an f if you differentiate u of x you bring down an f of x you differentiate u of y you bring down an f of y and then you set u equal to 0 so you end up calculating the average of f of x into f of y so like that you can calculate average of f of x average of f of x into f of y average of f of x f of y f of z like that so you can calculate all those so called moments of uh, the so that random variable is the path that f itself is that random variable. So you can calculate all the moments very conveniently and more specifically if you first take the logarithm of that this g so this is what we have been calling g take the logarithm and differentiate you get something which is typically called the correlation function that means it is so I will tell you what correlation function is suppose it is the so the two, two point correlation function corresponds to uh, the difference between the average of f of x into f of y minus average of f of x into average of f of y. So in other words uh, uh, what this two point correlation function tells you is uh, how uh, the uh, average of f of x into f of y differs from uh, so typically you see if f of x and f of y are unrelated random variables finding the average of their product is same as uh, finding the average of each of them separately and then multiplying them. But then these uh, two uh, f of x into f of y f of x is not uh, I mean it is the same random path evaluated at x and f of y is the same random path evaluated at y so they are not unrelated. So what this difference does is it, it tells you uh, how much the average of f of x into f of y differs from the average of f of x times average of f of y. Uh, 
So that is why it is called the correlation function. So that means it tells you um, to what extent f of x is correlated with f of y. So you expect them to be correlated because basically they are just uh, quantities evaluated on the same path at different points. But because they are on the same path you expect them to be correlated. So the degree of correlation may differ as you vary x and y. So typically if x and y are far apart you expect less correlation compared to when they are closer together. But whatever it is this tells you the correlation function. So it tells you how they differ. So you can have a higher order correlation also. So you, you can ask yourself how does this differ from various ways of pairing uh, you know the f's and with uh, each other. So you can either like separately evaluate all of them or you pair two of them together like that. So what this tells you is uh, it, it kind of subtracts out all the different ways of pairing f and even after subtracting it out it will still not be fully faithful representation of what that is. So the difference between uh, the actual average between f of x times f of y into f of z and the difference between that and the uh, different ways of pairing the f's uh, is basically the correlation function because it is kind of what is left over after you have subtracted out all the different ways in which you can pair it up and different ways in which you can pretend that they are all uncorrelated. Okay, so after subtracting them out something will still remain and that whatever remains is basically called the correlation function. So that is uh, pretty much uh, again a summary of what I explained earlier in a different uh, way of saying it. So now I am going to uh, tell you some uh, uh, slightly more advanced extension of whatever I was talking about because this will be useful later on. So, so remember that in quantum mechanics you typically uh, deal with uh, perturbations that means that uh, usually you will have a model which is exactly solvable and there will be some extra terms which cannot uh, which will spoil exact solvability but does not mean that the problem cannot be uh, tackled. It just means that you have to expand in powers of that extra term. So that is called perturbation theory. So even here in this context uh, you can imagine perturbation theory. For example, if your probability distribution is not exactly Gaussian but it has this additional term which is quartic which is fourth power. So you might think why did I choose a fourth power? I will allow you to think about it because third power will create some problems because second power is already here. So the next higher power is third power which you will have to explain to me in the exercises why that is not acceptable. So the after the third power it is just the fourth power. So that is the perturbation that I introduce into the problem and now I want to again ask myself the same question what is uh, g of u. That means that what is the average of this quantity f of x, u of x, dx or in this particular case I have chosen instead of f I have chosen h because I do not want the distraction of uh, end points being uh, y1 and y2. So I have chosen y1 equals y2 equals 0. So in which case that f becomes h. So you remember what the distinction was between f and h. Basically f is uh, that uh, path where the end points are y1, y2 but h is the path where you subtract out uh, the most probable path and you end up with uh, you know 0, 0 as the end points. So I mean already there is this complication of perturbation so I do not want those well understood uh, distractions to complicate matters further. So I start with h instead of f ok. So the end points are now 0. So now the question is uh, what I want to do is I want to treat this problem perturbatively so I write g as e raised to f. And now I expand this f in powers of uh, this the coefficient this is the cup, so called coupling constant. And so I expand in powers of g which basically tells you uh, how strong the non, uh, non Gaussian nature of that integrand is. So uh, bottom line is that uh, if I uh, first set g equal to 0 I end up with this and this is easy to do 
right because uh, we have done this earlier and f of 1 is basically when uh, you expand in powers of uh, uh, so so i'll allow you to think about how so you just insert all you do is insert this expression here so because this is f of u so instead of f of u ins you insert this expansion okay and then basically you uh, expand both sides in powers of g and you compare both sides so when g is so the g to the power 0 term is this one so the g to the power 1 term will give you this and uh, so the higher order terms are similarly uh, more complicated i'll allow you to calculate it yourself but bottom line is that uh, the first order term is uh, already uh, somewhat challenging and we'll have to do it so you see uh, the point is that the first order term this f1 uh, so you see this f of u is basically the whatever it was when that uh, quartic perturbation was absent this is the unperturbed f which we already know from the earlier section what that is but all now we have to calculate this first order correction to uh, f so that happens to be this one okay so now you see it's the same as calculating the average of uh, h to the power 4 in terms of uh, including this so called source term so this u is in some sense co sometimes called a source term because you are introducing the source of uh, correlations so what capital u of x does is it uh, introduces a source for correlations and it, so in other words it uh, that source generates the correlation function so this u of x is a source its source of correlations because it allows you to uh, extract the correlations uh, through its introduction and g of u is basically the generating function because by suitably differentiating with respect to the source you are generating all the correlations okay so uh, that's what that is so now because h to the power 4 may be written as the fourth derivative of the source because you see if you take the fourth derivative with respect to u so each time you take a derivative you bring down an h so four times you bring down four h's which is what you need here because that's what it is at that, at that level so you see this f1 has the simple form namely this okay so uh, so you can simply differentiate this uh, four times so if you take uh, you know you, you just go ahead and differentiate e each time you differentiate so if you differentiate first time you will get df0 dux again times eff0 then again if you differentiate once more you, you have to differentiate this first then times this then again this first times that so you will get this whole square plus second derivative like that so if you do that four times this is what you end up with and then you divide by this quantity so when you do that you get this result okay and from our earlier calculation we know what that f of u is in terms of the fourier series uh, that we have been successful in writing so uh, so when you go ahead and so you can resubstitute the coefficient u of n in terms of the original u's because uh, the is u of n's are related to the u of u's through an inverse transform and when you substitute that you get this uh, expression of f of u in terms of the source uh, in real space okay in, in terms of the source u of x and u of x dash so it involves uh, so so basically this uh, this unperturbed uh, function so basically what is this f of 0 is the logarithm of the generating function for the unperturbed case so that function uh, has uh, the form the source at x times source at x dash times some function which depends on x and x dash and that is what I have called w okay so now this w happens to uh, so you so now it is important for us to evaluate this w because you have to evaluate this summation because it is a well, well defined question you know there is an n there there is an n there and there is an n here so it is a perfectly valid question that if you sum over all possible n's starting from minus to plus infinity what is the answer so uh, 
So, this uh, I mean you one way of doing this is to simply uh, insert this in some symbolic algebra package like Mathematica or MATLAB and allow the computer to tell you the answer which is of course what is typically done these days nobody ever takes pride in doing tedious calculations anymore because uh, that is what computers are there for. So, I strongly encourage you to learn uh, symbolic algebra uh, computer packages like Mathematica or MATLAB. My favorite is Mathematica because uh, I find it especially useful for uh, tedious physics uh, related calculations. But uh, on the other hand, if uh, you are more old fashioned and you do not have access to software rather than just throwing your hands up and say I cannot do it because I do not have software, you should uh, try to learn how the software itself does it. After all, you know how does the software do it? It does it because it knows a systematic method invented by mathematicians uh, several hundred years ago. So, after all, all this calculus is all very old subject, right. I mean, so, uh, bottom line is that uh, this is this is how the ancients would do it and this is how your software would also do it. Uh, it is just that we would not, uh, if, we, if we had software, we would make the software do it and how would the software do it? The way the ancients did it and the way the ancients did it is that they convert the summation to a differential equation. So, in other words, if you uh, operate uh, on W this operator, you will see that it actually becomes a Dirac delta function. And not only that it is uh, subject to these boundary conditions that uh, at A and B the W's are 0, which is exactly what we expect. So, now, uh, so you can go ahead and solve this and the W that is consistent with these constraints. So, when X and X dash are you know between A and B and uh, so, uh, that is what that is, okay. So, and this n, n 1 and n 2 are, so you can explicitly write down the answer for w. So, so this was your f of, uh, so in other words, this f of 0 which is the unperturbed uh, value for the logarithm of the generating function now can be expressed in terms of source at x times source at x dash times w x x dash integrated over all x and x dash. So, in, in other words this. So, now, uh, now that you know what w is, you can go ahead and insert that here and you can evaluate that, but that is assuming you know what the sources are. You cannot really proceed any further because these sources are very general u of x, but you can leave it like this because that is, this is as far as we are interested in going anyway. So, the point is that we got the w that is the key. So, now we go ahead and find the first order correction to the basically what is called the well you it is just the logarithm of the generating function. Yeah. So, the, the first order correction to the logarithm the generating function. Uh, in StatMic it would be called free energy you know if you think of uh, G as your partition function F would be the free energy. You do not have to call it that because we are not talking about physics now we are talking about uh, I mean general mathematics with uh, probability distributions that are functionals. All right, so now all we have to do is go ahead and calculate this F1. So the F1 simply means that uh, you just have to differentiate with respect to uh, x, x dash, whatever. So remember what F1 is. It's this. So so now that you know what F0 is, you simply uh, perform the required differentiation and then finally integrate over x. Okay, so when you do all that, uh, you end up uh, getting. Yeah, I've skipped a step, so you'll end up getting some horrendous expression. But finally, when you try to calculate what you are interested in, which is this uh, second moment, that is the correlation function because remember that uh, h of x on an average is 0. 
because uh, you know the endpoints are zero, so it's see on an average it's going to be zero because it starts at zero, ends at zero. So on an average, h is zero. So the endpoints are zero, the average is zero. But however, the average of h x into x h x dash will not be zero because that's the so-called correlation function, and the correlation function is simply given by this. And when you evaluate this, it comes out to be this. So, in other words, if there is no perturbation, the correlation function is just W times some constant. But if there is a non Gaussian term, namely G, so that correlation function acquires a first order correction of this sort. So, now somebody has to go ahead and do this integral over Y, which I will leave you to the exercises. Okay, so it says. Uh, well, the next order is left to even this itself is left to the exercises because I have to integrate over y because w is known. So, to see what w is. w is explicitly this where n 1 is this n 2 is that. So, I know what w is. So, this is doable. Okay. So, uh, bottom line is that is what it is. So, this uh, so this whole activity this whole section was meant to introduce you to integrating over function spaces and it tries to motivate the integration over function spaces by pointing out that the reason why we do that is because we interpret the function as some kind of a path and uh, in quantum mechanics all paths are possible although some are more probable than others. So, that means that you are forced to introduce a probability distribution associated with each path. And uh, if those probability distributions are Gaussian, then you can go ahead and uh, perform certain uh, calculations exactly. You can find the average of the path or the correlation between one path and the neighboring path. Yeah, so that sort of thing. So, what I did was explain to you how to uh, think of these concepts, introduce them, evaluate them and so on. But then I also pointed out that uh, typically in applications the uh, integrands are not Gaussian, especially when you have interaction between particles, it is typically more complicated than a Gaussian. So, the simplest non-Gaussian is one where there is a quartic term. So, that quartic term can be analyzed through perturbation theory. And I evaluated the first order term and I invited you to generalize this to higher orders. Okay, so, that sort of completes my introductory discussion of uh, integrating over function spaces. So, now I come to the physics motivation of that. So, so the earlier section was fully mathematical. So, in other words, I introduced the mathematical notion of integrating over function spaces. So, so it has no um, relevance to physics until I make such a connection, right. So, those of you who are not particularly mathematically minded will probably have got impatient by now. So, many of you will be wondering why am I discussing so much of tedious mathematics, where is the physics, okay. So, usually many physicists learn maths as a uh, you know as a last resort there. They operate on a need to know basis. So, in other words they will learn only that maths that is necessary to answer the physics question. So, that is uh, uh, that is neither good nor bad, but it is certainly how most of us operate. So, because of that it is important that I explain to you what the physics behind these uh, mathematical uh, subjects are. So, namely the integrating over function spaces. So, uh, so, in order for me to explain the physics behind this, I have to introduce some formalism. Okay, so, uh, I will just briefly mention the starting uh, uh, idea behind this, uh, you know, this whole idea of path integral approach to quantum mechanics. Uh, which is basically motivates the need for in integrating over function spaces. So, I am going to just start because uh, time is running out. So, in the next lecture, I will begin and properly explain the whole idea behind uh, path integral approach to quantum mechanics. So, 
so you see this uh, let me read off the starting paragraph of this chapter so it says quantum mechanics as it is taught in various undergraduate courses typically focuses on developing the formalism using a phase space or hamiltonian description of classical mechanics so this gives an impression to the student that lagrangians cannot be used to develop a formalism of quantum mechanics of course this is not true so it is dirac who is credited with uh, originating the idea of the path integral in physics uh, however it was feynman who popularized this idea and make it uh, made it widely accessible to physicists so so that's the whole idea you know the the idea that uh, you can uh, do quantum mechanics using lagrangians uh, was already known to the pioneers of quantum mechanics like dirac but uh, the next generation of physicists like feynman uh, who came after the pioneers they are the ones who popularized this idea of path integrals so i'll have to explain to you where exactly this idea of integrating over paths or integrating over function spaces enters into the subject because the way you study quantum mechanics it's all about operators uh, expectation values matrix elements and so on see these are the types of ideas we are familiar with in quantum mechanics so somehow i have to introduce uh, i have to start with those familiar concepts namely operators matrix elements expectation values and then i have to uh, manipulate those uh, expressions until i naturally encounter integrating over function spaces or integrating over paths okay so that's what i'm going to do in the next lecture so i'll allow you to stare at this slide and uh, i hope you will study ahead and if you have access to the textbook you should definitely study ahead so that uh, you will be it will be easier for you to follow the lectures also yeah so that's important so when you, whenever you are studying or whenever you are trying to learn a difficult subject studying ahead helps a lot so in other words you study uh, so if the teacher is teaching some chapter now you should have studied that chapter 3 days ago on your own of course you wouldn't have understood much but whatever you little you understand will be helpful in understanding the actual lecture that comes 3 days later so i hope you will do that and uh, i'll uh, meet you for the next class where i'll explain to you very properly how uh, quantum mechanics can be studied using lagrangians and that naturally introduces the concept of the path integral or integral over paths or uh, in other words integral over spaces of functions okay thank you mm -hmm.